director. The procedure of direct laryngoscopy and orotracheal intubation can be broken down into six steps. Proper positioning of the patient, opening of the mouth, control of the tongue, landmark recognition, control of the epiglottis, and placement of the endotracheal tube. The first step is proper positioning of the patient to align the axes of the oropharynx, pharynx, and larynx. These axes are not in alignment when the patient is lying supine with the head in neutral position. Slight neck flexion, created by 8 to 10 centimeters of head elevation, brings the pharyngeal and laryngeal axes into alignment. Extreme extension of the head at the atlanto-occipital joint then aligns the oropharyngeal axis with the other two axes. This positioning is contraindicated in known or suspected cervical spine injury. Head elevation is also not recommended for children and infants because of their relatively large head size and more anterior location of the pediatric larynx. The second step in orotracheal intubation is opening of the mouth. This can be done with a scissor technique using the thumb and middle finger of the right hand. The thumb is placed on the lower teeth and the middle finger is then used to push away the upper teeth. Remember, inserting fingers between the teeth of semi-conscious or awake patients can be dangerous. Alternatively, the fourth and fifth fingers of the left hand can push open the chin while holding and inserting the laryngoscope. The third step in orotracheal intubation is control of the tongue using the flange of the laryngoscope blade. The larger flange of the curved or Macintosh blade is easier for directing the tongue to the left side of the mouth than the smaller flange of the straight or Miller blade. Also, the curved blade has a natural fit with the curvature of the tongue and a natural stopping point in the vallecula at the base of the tongue and epiglottis. Step four in orotracheal intubation is landmark recognition. After the blade has been inserted, one of two landmarks should be recognized either the tip of the epiglottis or the posterior cartilages of the larynx. The tip of the epiglottis has a unique appearance that is unmistakable. The identification of the posterior cartilages of the larynx, however, requires a detailed appreciation of the laryngeal structures. On this model, note the following structures at the top of the larynx, as shown with the curved blade with the tip placed in the vallecula at the base of the tongue the tip of the epiglottis, the aryepiglottic folds coming down on each side, the paired cuneiform tubercles, the paired corniculate tubercles, and the interarytenoid notch. The cuneiform and corniculate tubercles are commonly called the arytenoid cartilages, although they are anatomically separate structures. In this video, we will refer to them as the posterior cartilages. Within the larynx, Note the false vocal cords, also known as the vestibular folds. The true vocal cords, or vocal ligaments, are white and have a vertical orientation during direct laryngoscopy, which is exaggerated by traction on the laryngoscope blade. The glottic opening widens during inspiration. Depending on the muscular tone of the patient and on the amount of traction on the laryngoscope, the glottic opening during laryngoscopy may be a small vertical slit or have a wide rhomboid shape. Following visualization of the posterior pharynx, one of two critical landmarks should come into view, either the epiglottis, shown here, or the posterior cartilages, as shown in this patient. Note that above the posterior cartilages and interarytenoid notch is the entrance into the larynx. Below the posterior cartilages is the esophagus, if the true vocal cords are not visualized, directing the endotracheal tube anterior to these landmarks will ensure endotracheal placement. If neither the epiglottis nor the posterior cartilages are visualized after blade insertion, the pink mucosa represents either the posterior pharynx, in which case the blade needs to be inserted further, or the esophagus, in which case the blade needs to be withdrawn. Entrance into the esophagus following blade insertion is very common with a large Macintosh number 4 blade or the longer straight blades. 
Remember, the epiglottis is attached at the base of the tongue. If you are having trouble finding a landmark, methodically advance the blade down the tongue until it comes into view. The fifth step involves control of the epiglottis and exposure of the larynx. With the curved blade, the epiglottis is lifted indirectly by pressure on the vallecula and the underlying hyoepiglottic ligament. On this cadaver cross-section, note the differences in the epiglottis when the tip of the blade, colored in blue, is loosely applied to the vallecula and when it is firmly pressed, causing the epiglottis to be lifted upwards. Traction on the laryngoscope in the direction of the handle causes elevation of the epiglottis when the tip is correctly placed. Levering backwards on the handle of the laryngoscope can not only cause damage to the teeth, but also worsens the exposure of the larynx, because the tip of the curved blade is then not correctly applied to the vallecula. With the straight blade, the larynx is exposed by directly lifting the epiglottis. Straight blades are recommended in infants and small children, where the epiglottis is relatively large and floppy. The last step in orotracheal intubation is placement of the endotracheal tube. The tube should always be inserted down the right side of the mouth. Advancing the tube down the midline obscures the line of sight to the larynx and is a frequent cause of esophageal intubation, even after the larynx has been correctly exposed. A tube stylet is generally recommended for emergency situations and facilitates control of the tip of the tube. Now that we've reviewed the basic steps of direct laryngoscopy and intubation, let's review intubations from start to finish as recorded in the operating room with the Airway Cam Direct Laryngoscopy Video System. This intubation is done with a Macintosh 3 blade with a fiber optic light source. The scissor technique is used to open the mouth and the posterior pharynx is then visualized. The brightly lit edge of the epiglottis comes into view. Traction in the direction of the laryngoscope handle exposes the glottic opening. The tube is then passed down the right side of the mouth. In this still shot, note how the laryngoscopist holds the endotracheal tube between the thumb and middle finger of his right hand. This allows the laryngoscopist to remain visually focused on the target without looking away in order to grab the endotracheal tube. Notice that the tube does not have a stylet. As already mentioned, styleted tubes are easier to manipulate and recommended for all emergency intubations. The laryngeal view in this patient does not include the white of the vocal cords, but the posterior cartilages and interarytenoid notch are well seen. The small dark hole above these structures is the glottic opening. The following intubation is also with a Macintosh number 3 blade. The scissor technique is used to open the mouth. The pink posterior pharynx is well seen, followed by the epiglottis. Pressure on the hyoepiglottic ligament at the vallecula causes the epiglottis to flip upwards, revealing a nice view of the larynx. The endotracheal tube is carefully guided down the right side of the mouth into the glottic opening, and the tube is stabilized at the lip line. The tube should be inserted to 21 centimeters at the incisors in women and 23 centimeters for men. Manipulation of the epiglottis with the tip of the curved blade is so important that we will review it again in slow motion. The tip of the curved blade can be used to pick up the epiglottis directly, but it is designed to sit in the vallecula where the base of the tongue and the epiglottis meet. Firm pressure at the hyoepiglottic ligament causes the epiglottis to flip upward and expose the larynx. This is best achieved by directing the upward force on the laryngoscope in the direction of the handle and not backwards onto the teeth. Although the laryngeal view on this patient is excellent, the white of the true vocal cords is barely seen. Anterior to the glottic opening is the epiglottis. Laterally are the ariepiglottic folds and posteriorly are the posterior cartilages and the interarytenoid notch. The next intubation is with a Macintosh number 4 blade on a young man. Following a scissor technique opening of the mouth, the posterior pharynx is visualized and the blade further advanced until the tip of the blade fits into the vallecula. The edge of the epiglottis and the posterior cartilages become visible. 
While maintaining a view of the target, the tube is passed down the right side of the mouth. Let's review the lifting motion with the laryngoscope blade as demonstrated in slow motion on this patient. This lifting motion serves to align the laryngeal axis with the pharyngeal axis, bringing the larynx into view. Proper positioning of the patient with 8 to 10 centimeters of head elevation minimizes the amount of head lift that must be done with the laryngoscope blade. This next intubation with a Miller blade shows posterior pharynx, epiglottis, and esophagus as the blade is advanced, withdrawn, and re-advanced in an effort to directly elevate the epiglottis. Unlike the curved blade, the straight blade has no stability along the curvature of the tongue and no natural stopping point since it is not positioned into the molecular. The laryngoscopist reaches around to the anterior neck with his right hand to posteriorly displace the larynx, bringing it into better alignment with his line of sight. Retraction of the upper right lip aids visualization as the tube is passed. This still shot provides a comparison look at the esophagus and the larynx. The entrance into the esophagus, pictured in the upper half of the screen, is a very round hole without structure. It is located posterior to the larynx and slightly to the right of midline. The laryngeal inlet, shown below, has a three-dimensional appearance created by the posterior cartilages, interarytenoid notch, and the areopiglottic folds. As already discussed, the true vocal cords are often not well visualized during direct laryngoscopy. Recognition of the posterior cartilages adjacent to the glottic opening is a consistently dependable landmark for identification of the entrance into the larynx. In slow motion, let's take a repeat look at the use of laryngeal manipulation by pressing on the thyroid cartilage on the anterior neck. While pressure on the cricoid cartilage by an assistant is often used to prevent passive regurgitation of stomach contents, pressure on the thyroid cartilage aids landmark recognition and visualization. The vocal cords are attached anteriorly to the thyroid cartilage. Manipulation, especially posterior displacement of this easily palpable structure, improves alignment of the larynx with the line of sight. An assistant is then used to continue pressure on the thyroid cartilage, freeing the laryngoscopist's right hand to place the endotracheal tube. The next laryngoscopy is performed with a Wisconsin blade, a straight blade with a larger and more round flange than the Miller blade. In this case, as with all straight blades, the epiglottis is elevated directly by the tip of the blade. Finding the correct depth of blade insertion and lifting the epiglottis requires a slight in and out motion. The laryngoscope is then lifted in standard fashion at a 45 degree angle in the direction of the handle. Lip retraction provides improved visualization down the right side of the mouth. Notice the round, almost tubular appearance of the flange of the Wisconsin blade in this still shot. The Miller blade has a much smaller flange. In an emergency situation, such as with massive tongue swelling, an endotracheal tube can be placed directly down the large barrel of the Wisconsin blade. Although tube passage from the right side in order not to block the line of sight is recommended. This next laryngoscopy is with a modified Macintosh blade. Watch as the chin is pushed open with the fourth and fifth digits of the laryngoscopist's left hand. The first landmarks to be recognized are the posterior cartilages and the interarytenoid notch. Unintentionally, the curved blade was inserted slightly deep and picked up the epiglottis directly. The tip of the epiglottis then drops beneath the blade as the blade is adjusted. Using the Mac as a miller is not a problem and often deliberately done, particularly with the larger curved blade. The next case involves a Macintosh number no. three blade. Following a push-off technique for opening the mouth, the blade is advanced further along the posterior pharynx and can be seen well away from the upper teeth. The epiglottis and posterior cartilages come into view surrounding the dark glottic opening. An assistant provides laryngeal manipulation and moves the posterior cartilages. The laryngoscopist pauses as the tube is directed towards the glottis. 
Exposure of the glottis alone does not ensure proper tube placement. Careful attention as the tip of the tube is inserted without taking your eye off of the target is critical for preventing esophageal placement. Using slow motion, let's take another look at the effect of laryngeal manipulation in this patient. Note how the epiglottis is brightly lit, positioned directly in front of the light source on the curved blade. An assistant moves the larynx and posterior cartilages in a posterior direction with manipulation of the thyroid cartilage from the anterior neck. The glottic opening is relatively dark and the true cords are not seen because of the shadowing by the epiglottis. Nevertheless, the posterior cartilages and interarytenoid notch clearly mark the entrance into the larynx. Returning to a straight blade, this next intubation initially demonstrates how placement of the blade on the left side causes the tongue to completely obscure the view. After repositioning the blade correctly down the right side, the laryngoscopist makes repeated attempts to pick up the epiglottis. The laryngoscopist also maintains a scissor technique to keep the mouth open, thereby aiding visualization. Once the epiglottis is positioned beneath the blade, elevation in the direction of the handle results in a good view of the true vocal cords. The Miller blade with its small flange often provides a relatively narrow opening for visualization and tube placement. The tube is directed down the right side of the mouth so as not to block the target until the last possible moment. Let's take another look at the laryngoscopic view we obtained in this patient. Note the small D-shaped flange of the Miller blade. The vocal cords have a very vertical appearance due to traction on the laryngoscope. The epiglottis is not visible since it is underneath the tip of the blade. This next intubation is done with a Macintosh number 3 blade with a fiber optic light source on an elderly woman with no upper teeth. When it comes to direct laryngoscopy, no teeth almost always means no problem. Here the posterior pharynx is well seen and the blade is further advanced. The posterior cartilages come into view. The tip of the curved blade has been inserted beneath the epiglottis instead of into the vollecula. The laryngoscopist retracts the upper lip and carefully directs the tube down the right side. The tube is advanced until the cuff of the endotracheal tube has been placed beyond the vocal cords. Reviewing the laryngoscopic view on this patient, notice how effectively the tongue has been controlled on the left side of the mouth. The lack of upper teeth opens up the mouth and makes alignment of the larynx with the line of sight less difficult. The white of the vocal cords is well seen. The following three laryngoscopies with different blades are all on the same adolescent patient. First, let's look at laryngoscopy with the Miller blade. There's a nice view of the posterior pharynx and epiglottis, as well as the round opening into the esophagus. More anteriorly is the larynx, and the posterior cartilages and glottic opening are well seen after repeat manipulation to lift the epiglottis. Comparing the appearance of the esophagus and the larynx, note how the esophagus is very round and without any adjacent structures. Remember, the esophagus is posterior or beneath the larynx. The larynx, as shown on the bottom part of the screen, has a three-dimensional appearance due to the prominences of the posterior cartilages and the interarytenoid notch. Also note that the laryngoscope blade is away from the teeth and that the tongue is well controlled on the left side of the mouth. Our second laryngoscopy on this patient is with a Macintosh number four blade. Following a scissor technique opening of the mouth, the posterior pharynx comes into view. With advancement of the blade and head lift, a good, although somewhat dark, view of the larynx is obtained. Note the effect of head lift in this patient as the larynx comes in and out of view. The tip of the epiglottis can be seen under the edge of the blade. Reviewing the laryngeal view just obtained, note that the posterior cartilages and interarytenoid notch is clearly seen. The glottis is relatively dark, and the true vocal cords are not visualized. Notice how well the tongue is controlled and that the blade is off of the upper teeth.
Our last laryngoscopy on this same patient is with the Macintosh number 3 blade. After a push off of the chin with the left hand, the blade is advanced with progressive visualization of the uvula, posterior pharynx, and finally, a bright view of the larynx, including the true vocal cords. This laryngeal view demonstrates that subtle differences in bulb position and blade design, such as the distance from the bulb to the tip of the blade in a number three versus a number four Macintosh, can result in much better illumination of the larynx. Notice the rhomboid-shaped glottic opening, the bright white vocal cords, the posterior cartilages, and the interarytenoid notch. The following two laryngoscopies show the importance of proper tongue control. The same blade is used on the same patient, but with much different results. In the first case, the epiglottis is readily located, and the initial view of the larynx is actually very good, including the posterior cartilages and the white of the true vocal cords. The epiglottis falls down repeatedly, however. Notice how the laryngoscopist changes the angle of the blade and re-advances in order to pick up the epiglottis. This happens several more times before the epiglottis is controlled. Finally, the posterior cartilages and glottic opening are seen, and an attempt is made to pass the tube. On the right side of the mouth, however, is a trapped section of tongue. The laryngoscopist cannot advance the tube around this trapped section of tongue. The epiglottis falls down again, and the laryngoscopist continues to struggle, trying to advance the tube. Finally, after several more efforts, this intubation attempt is ended. Repeat laryngoscopy on this same patient begins with much better control of the tongue. Although there are multiple efforts at elevating the epiglottis in this case as well, there is a wider area for visualization because of better tongue positioning on the left side of the mouth. Once the epiglottis is controlled, there is a good view of the posterior cartilages, one vocal cord, and the glottic opening. Passage of the tube down the right side of the mouth and into the larynx is accomplished without difficulty. This next case involves laryngoscopy on a five-year-old child with a Macintosh number two blade. A very sharp view of the vocal cords is achieved. A cuffless endotracheal tube is inserted down the right side and into the larynx. Reviewing this laryngeal view one more time, notice the large vestibular fold adjacent to the vocal cord on the right. Also notice that the anterior commissure of the vocal cords is well seen in this patient. Cuffless endotracheal tubes are generally used in pediatric patients under the age of eight. This is because the narrowest part of the pediatric airway, unlike in adults, is below the vocal cords. Notice on this still shot of endotracheal tube placement in this patient that the vocal cords can be seen adjacent to the tube. Once again, note the anterior commissure of the larynx. The epiglottis is not visible. Our final laryngoscopy is on a one-month-old infant with a small Miller blade. Although the structures are much smaller, the fundamental technique is the same. Tongue control, landmark identification, laryngeal exposure. A cuffless endotracheal tube is carefully inserted. The infant epiglottis is relatively large and horseshoe shaped. The posterior cartilages are also relatively larger in the infant. Even though the straight blade is being used, the tip of the blade must be in the vollecula because otherwise the epiglottis would not be seen. This concludes Volume 1 of the Airway Cam video series.